thanks again for uh, affording me the opportunity to partner with the, the board and help help lead us through this unique time in, in human history. We're taking a really balanced approach to all of this and uh, we've been clear that there was a lot of uncertainty from the first time I updated the board on January 12th. We were clear about how unclear things were and how this would improve over time. And it is improving over time. And so I looked back this morning at my notes from January 12th, from January 19th, and you know, when everything is right in front of you, it's easy to lose sight of how far we've already come. As for the numbers, uh, today we have a total of 1,598 total cases over time. We have 93 active cases. We have 1,482 recovered. We've had 23 fatalities. And we have four active hospitalizations. Uh, we were moved, the regional stay at home order was removed by the state. It was lifted on January 25th, yesterday. And we're now back to being in the purple tier that we were in before the regional stay at home order. Uh, that means that we can have outdoor dining. That means that places like hair and nail salons can reopen with modifications. And for the other things, I'd encourage you all, if you have questions, to go to the government's uh, blueprint for a safer economy page and look at what those specifics are. To date, um, and I will talk more vaccines as I, as I go in, but just leading into it, our data dashboard, uh, which can be found at covid19.calaveras.gov.us. Our dashboard now has the total number of vaccines given, administered, and that number is now up to 2,080. A week ago, I reported it was 919. So we've come a long way in a week. Uh, out of those 2,080, 1,835 are first round vaccines. 245 are the second dose. So as you can tell, a lot of first round doses, now those second round doses are catching up to us, working through a lot of those. Same story, I assume, at Mark Twain. But I'm going to try to be a little more organized this time, Doug, and, and run through what I've got to run through first and then turn it over to you at the end uh, so that I don't confuse everybody again. Uh, testing is still important. We've done, uh, public health has done 507 tests since December 23rd, uh, not counting what's being done at OptumServe. I will say that uh, this week, today, we have testing at Ironstone. Tomorrow, we have testing at the Armory in Copperopolis. And then, of course, there's still the OptumServe site in Sonora. Uh, we're still in a surge. It has exceeded our capacity. However, we're still doing investigations. We're still doing contact tracing. And we're still doing testing testing continues to be stable. Um, as far as our testing rates and case rates, because I know there's a question about, we're in the purple tier, how do we get into a lower tier? We are uh, statistically a ways off from that uh, because right now our uh, test positivity rate is about twice what it needs to be uh, to get down into the next lower tier, which is the red tier. Okay, so I will update on that every time that we come back and of course in between if somehow we make it to a lower tier. Uh, but for now that doesn't look very likely uh, within the immediate future. Um, okay, so before I get into vaccines, because I know that's the big topic to address today, I just want to remind you guys that Prevention is still the best defense. Wash your hands, wear a face covering, and practice physical distancing. 
If you're sick, please stay home. Please isolate from others. The best way for the public to help is by not getting COVID. And, and the best thing you can do to improve your chances of that are the things that I'm mentioning, okay? All right, let's get into vaccines. So uh, I'll remind everybody that you know, even coming into the January 12th board meeting, two weeks ago, uh, we were just beginning our, our partnership with Mark Twain. Mark Twain hadn't even started vaccinating the 65 plus yet. That was two weeks ago. Fast forward to today, and I mean, these guys over at Mark Twain are doing a fantastic job of trying to get as many people in. But the demand is incredibly high. You know this, if you're a member of the public, if you're a board member hearing from members of the public, if you're me hearing from the board members and from the CAO and from the public, you know that there is more demand than there is supply. And that always creates a little bit of fear and a lot of frustration and frankly, some anger. And we understand all those things. Now, I was thinking about it this morning and I was reflecting on comments that were made at the state yesterday and the analogy that was used was that it's sort of like loading an airplane. And it's, you know, trying to determine who is getting the vaccines when uh, is a structured process through the tier system that I will read off this morning. Uh, but it's like loading an airplane in the sense of if you're loading first class and then you're going to wait till absolutely every single passenger in first class is on the plane before you move to business class. And then you wait till every single one of them until you get into one of the other boarding groups. You're going to take hours and hours to load a plane. So we want to do things in an orderly and equitable way. And we, at the same time, we have to balance that with being as efficient as we can. In other words, we also want to get as many doses into arms as quickly as we can uh, to make sure that we work toward that herd immunity that we all want to have. So it's the balance of those two things that I say we're taking as balanced of approach as we can. As quick as we're getting supply, we're administering the supply. Doses come in every week, doses go into arms every week. And that's what we're doing. And, and we're working with Mark Twain, we're working with our medical community, we're working with the state tier system, and we're trying to get through all that. Only the problem is, in the analogy I gave you of loading an airplane, we're not really loading an airplane. And if we are, the airplane is about the size of a football stadium. Because if we have roughly two thirds of our population that we need to vaccinate, we're looking at 30,000. And then there's two doses. So just round number is 60,000, right? Maybe it's 55,000 in the end, because maybe uh, you, know, you sort out some of the under 16 that, that aren't eligible. So if we have to get 55,000 doses in arms, and so far we've done 2,000. So we're not loading an airplane, we're loading a football stadium. And it's a football stadium for people who are, need to be fed. And we only have so much food to give them. And that is the task at hand. So we're trying to do things as orderly as we can, and as equitably as we can while following the state tier system. There's just only so much supply. So last week, we got a total of 700 doses in toward the end of last week. This week, we've been promised 100 doses. It, it doesn't mean that we won't end up getting more. Uh, sometimes we do, but right now that's what we've been told. So if 2,000 doesn't grow to 60,000 overnight, um, you know, just understand it is a supply issue and everybody's fighting to get into that football stadium. We need to work together and we need to be in this as a team. Okay, so what are we doing this week? We're continuing to vaccinate emergency responders. We're continuing through 1A. read off 1A to you because there's been some confusion out there. 1A includes healthcare workers. It includes long-term care residents, acute care, psychiatric care, correctional facility hospitals, 
skilled nursing facilities, assisted living facilities. Those are the facilities that are contracted to be done by CVS through the federal contract. And similar settings for older and medically vulnerable individuals. 1A also includes paramedics, EMTs, and others providing emergency medical services. Home health care and in-home supportive services. So we're still working with the uh, IHSS folks. Community health workers, public health field staff, primary care clinics, urgent care clinics, correctional facility clinics, other settings and healthcare workers, specialty clinics, laboratory workers, dental and oral health clinics, pharmacy staff not working in settings in higher tiers. So that's kind of our phase 1A. Some of those people have just gotten a first shot. A lot of those people are coming back in for second shots. It's a lot of coordination happening. Those are the things being coordinated by public health. At the same time, going back to the analogy of loading the plane, while we've got them moving, Mark Twain has been working on phase 1B, tier 1, which is the individual 65 and over. So those folks have been getting their first dose over the past week and a half. We also have in that same tier, those, ex those at risk of exposure at work in the following sectors, education and childcare, emergency services, includes emergency response, food and agriculture. Obviously we can't vaccinate all of those subgroups at once. So we're working our way into phase 1B. The priority from the state has been to work with that 65 and over population. And the most recent expectation from the governor is that once we get through that tier one of phase 1B, that we will be prioritizing by age after that. In other words, from our more aged population working down in a systematic way. So these changes come very quickly from the state and they expect us to respond. A lot of times we have things, we have our schedules already mapped out for a week, week and a half, two weeks in advance with things that are already planned. So if you've heard something about, oh, well, I believe they strayed from this tier or went in this direction, you know, these things are mapped out. When the state makes an adjustment to their tier schedule, we also make that adjustment. But the state also understands that we don't make those adjustments overnight. If, if you're scheduled for your appointment tomorrow and uh, you know the state makes a change today, we're not going to call you and cancel your appointment tomorrow. Right? We're going to change things from the point to where we move forward. Right? So that's a week and a half later from where we're not scheduled out anymore. That's where we make the change from. That's obviously been a di very difficult balance for us. Uh, we understand the public frustration. Uh, we're as frustrated as anybody with the frequent changes. We've given that feedback to the state. Uh, we want clarity as much as anybody. We really don't like being caught in the middle of that. At the same time, we're working as hard as we can to make sure that we distill and clarify for those of you in the public. So hopefully some of this is, is helpful. Um, so getting back to this week, we're continuing with 1A, which is that first tier. And then we're continuing to work with the 65 plus over at Mark Twain. Um, we're supporting CCOE in getting their folks vaccinated, which is in that phase 1B tier 1. And we've also started with child care workers this week, which is in that same tier. A lot of people are probably wondering about the food and ag because that's at the bottom of that same phase 1B tier 1. So uh, they're on our radar. And as we work our way into February and we get the folks that I've already mentioned set up, we'll be working to get registration systems going and make sure that we're prepared for the food and ag group. Um, I can't give you a concrete timeline for when that's coming. 
but roughly, um, I would hope that we're getting there by March. Really depends on supply. Okay, you know when when we get when we get told to vaccinate all the people in these groups by the state, and then we get a supply of 700 followed by a supply of 100 over a two-week period. And frankly, Mark Twain through Dignity Health gets whatever supply allotment that they get, uh, which isn't what they request, right? They, they get what they get like we do. Um, you know, we can only move so much and we can only project so much. And I understand your frustrations with me and our lack of clarity. And uh, frankly, I just don't want to overpromise anything to anybody and start making promises about when we're going to be able to vaccinate food and ag when we haven't gotten through the other parts of what leads into that. Okay, so we will communicate every single time that we get up here, as we have been doing. Um, but understand, it's a football stadium, 60,000 people packed in. We've gotten 2,000 so far, we've gotten them into arms. We're doing the best we can. All right, uh, with that, Uh, we know registration has been difficult and confusing. Talking about registering uh, over at Mark Twain, I'm going to let Doug speak to that in a minute, uh, but I just want to put it up there. Um, we're working to solve that. Mark Twain is working to solve that. Um, the state has also announced uh, a, quote, my turn online system. We don't have all the details we need to have on that, as usual. Uh, the state has made an announcement and details are to follow. So we will see what that system brings. In the meantime, we're working to make sure that by the time, you know, right now, the, the folks that public health is vaccinating are what we call pods of people who are being invited in. It's orderly. These are specific subgroups. We're reaching out to them. We know how to reach them. We get that word out. We invite those people in. By the time we get to a more open process where we need people registering, we will have an online registration process for that. Okay, Mark Twain is working on that as well. But we also need to balance that with what the state is putting up. So if the state isn't able to hold up their end and execute what they need to do, we will make sure that things are orderly by the time it's your turn. Right now, continuing to work through the groups that, that I mentioned earlier. Um, one side comment I want to make is there, there have been a lot of questions about if I get the first dose, how do I know I'm going to get the second dose? We're committed to that. We've been very conservative about that. We're making sure that we have a second dose supply. Now there's some miscommunication at the state level and in other counties. And frankly, some have made decisions that are slightly different than what we've made and being really aggressive and expecting and just hoping that the second dose will show up. And then what happens? Sometimes that second dose doesn't show up. We're committed in Calaveras to make sure that that second dose is accounted for at the time that we give you the first dose. We want to make sure that people are getting their second doses. Okay, last thing I'm going to say before I turn it over to uh, our partner, Doug Archer, is just again, we're taking a balanced approach to this. Um, we want our residents to be safe. The board members want you guys to be safe. Wear your masks, distance, wash your hands, avoid large gatherings. We want the people who want the vaccine to get vaccinated. We're working through it. It's a football stadium full of people, 60,000 doses. We've gotten 2,000 in. We want our kids in school. I've gotten some questions about why we're vaccinating teachers. Well, because we're following the state tiers. It's in phase 1B, tier 1. And frankly, our community wants our schools open. So those things align. And, and we're proud that we've partnered with our schools to make sure that our teachers are getting vaccinated. And I wish them well. We want our kids in school. And we want our businesses open. You know, so all of these things play together. We're all in this together. And we need to work together and build each other up. Okay, this is a difficult, 
monumental time. I'm sorry if my tone is a little dark today. I'm clearly feeling a little bit of the pressure, um, and I'm happy. I know what I signed up for. At the same time, I want to make sure that we're not just clawing at each other and pointing fingers all the time. Okay? We're, we're trying to be as accountable as we can for things. We're trying to work countless hours around the clock, do the best we can to bring you the best service we possibly can, all right? And we're in it together. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Archer, can we turn it over to you for uh, an update from our wonderful partners at Mark Twain? Thanks, Sam. Um, yeah, so I think the, the thing that is going to get us through this uh, interesting time is the partnership. Um, I think we're doing pretty good about building that partnership prior to the pandemic, and um, I think we've really hit stride in the past few weeks. So I appreciate all the help from the county. And, um, you know, I, I, you mentioned clarity, Sam. Um, <laughs> so I had a chat with my leadership team here the other day. Um, there isn't clarity. So we expect clarity, we want clarity, but we also have to be willing to admit or digest the fact that there just isn't clarity right now at all levels of the, the nation. Um, and, and how we, not only how we move forward, but um, what resources we have to do so. So we'll get back to that. Um, so real quick, uh, here's what's going on in the hospital today. Um, we have a pretty high census, although it's not due to COVID. Uh, we have a census of 15. Um, we have four positive COVID patients. Three of them are in med surge. One is in our ICU. Um, that one in the ICU is on a ventilator. Uh, so what that means in terms of the ICU capacity number, which is kind of the, the gold standard metric, we have three patients in our eight bed ICU. So we have a little over 60% capacity left. So we're, we're actually um, doing pretty well in terms of ICU care. Uh, the ED visits have been actually going down a little bit. Yesterday, we only had 23 patients in the ED. Uh, our average is about 30. So um, probably some of that had to do with the weather. Um, wasn't easy to get down the hill yesterday. Um, so that's kind of the high level of where we're at at the hospital right now. Um, so let's switch to vaccines. Um, we are also holding um, so that we can guarantee that second dose. Um, I, I, I agree with Sam, that's, that's an important thing for us to do. Supply chain is definitely the biggest concern here. Um, I just talked to our pharmacist um, right before this call, and we are also hoping, um, I don't have confirmation, so I wanna be very clear about that. We are hoping for another 100 doses this week from the Dignity Health Supply Chain. Um, so um, with the help of our good partners at the county, um, we are able to get a few more doses from them and we will be hosting another vaccine clinic uh, Thursday and Friday this week. Um, right now we know we have 400 doses to give. If I get the 100 from Dignity, then we'll, we'll give another 100. But right now we're planning on 400 doses between Thursday and Friday. Because of the weather, um, we're going to do a short day on Thursday. Um, you know, keep in mind that a lot of this clinic, uh, vaccine clinic activity is outside uh, for social distancing and things like that. So when it's windy and rainy, it's not so fun. So we're going to do a half day on Thursday and a full day on Friday. Um, just to emphasize the supply chain issue, um, our clinic, two days last week, gave 300 doses a day. Um, and without too much pain, uh, I think 300 is a pretty easy pace for us. But we can't do 300 a day when our supply is only 100 a week. I think anybody can you know, do that math. So supply chain is definitely the key. I'm hearing a lot of positive things and some optimistic comments from you know, our leaders at the national level, and I'm hoping that translates to more vaccines showing up at either the county or at, at our hospital. 
Um, I can tell you that our, our I think Marina Bolin, our clinic director, and the entire clinic crew has done a great job. Uh, very efficient process. Um, and we gave 860 vaccines last week out of that clinic. Um, so, so that's the good news. Um, the, the challenge remains managing our wait list. Um, and, and, you know, there's, there's just no two ways about it. Um, we are not used to getting 12 to, I mean, we're all, best estimate is we're up to about 15,000 calls at this point, um, due to vaccines. Um, we've got roughly 5,000 people on our wait list now. Um, uh, just to kind of give you a, you know, a benchmark throughout the entire year, all of our clinics see about 35,000 people. So that's about 3,000 a month. We've gotten 15,000 calls in the past two weeks. <laughs> so, um, it, it, you know, and not, this isn't a woe is us and, and feel sorry for us. Um, it's just the sheer magnitude. So the other thing that I want to stress here, and this is maybe not the, the best customer service statement, um, but when people call in and we aren't able to schedule them right away because we don't have a vaccine to give them, they're going on a wait list. They need to understand that that's a wait list. You're going to have to wait a little bit until we have more vaccine. Um, I think the, the big challenge that we had, and I, I spent a lot of time um, chatting with some community members over the weekend about this, is, is the way it kind of unfolded. So uh, a little more than a week ago, uh, it was two Fridays ago when we published our, our scheduling number. Of course, we were inundated with calls. Um, many of those were voicemails because, you know, the phones wouldn't turn over quick enough. And so I think I mentioned this last week, but within 15 minutes, we had almost a thousand voicemails. And if you can imagine the, the couple of people that we had available to kind of staff those phones, they're getting calls quicker than they can check voicemails. So chronologically, it didn't work out um, the way I think most people would expect it to be, meaning I was the first person to call, I should be the first person scheduled. Uh, technology just didn't work that way. The, you know, the first person to call was a voicemail. Um, and then when we went to check the voicemail, we got a live call. So there was a, you know, it just, it didn't, it wasn't a really smooth flow um, for us. And then also keep in mind, if we have 5,000 people on our wait list and we've only given 860 vaccines so far, that's, you know, almost 6,000 people total wait list and vaccines, 5,000 of them are disappointed. 5,000 of them didn't get a vaccine. Um, I, I do understand that. I understand the anxiety around this. Um, but what's really important is, is, is really just having patience and bearing with us. Um, we also did not, we're, we're working on some solutions here, but we did not want to pull our staff from scheduling and from our normal operations. You know. Keep in mind, we're still running clinics and hospitals for non-COVID care. Um, we didn't want to pull those staff simply to call people that were on the wait list to tell them that they're on the wait list. Because that doesn't, that doesn't move us forward as, as a community. I understand it can release some of the anxiety for that person that has the confirmation that they know they're on the wait list. Um, but it, it's not as productive. Um, so I, I, I understand the anxiety. I, I really do. And the frustration, um, slash anger that that can cause. So here's what we're trying to do to solve that problem. We don't have the staff to pull off, to call, you know, 5,000 people that confirm they're on the wait list. However, we are working very, very quickly, hopefully, um, with a, there's three different vendors that we're looking at, um, we should have proposals from all three by end of day today. And we would have them uh, essentially call our wait list and confirm with those individuals that they're on it. Um, 
best case scenario, you know, we get those three proposals today, we make a decision today, we sign the agreement today, that group probably wouldn't be able to start that work until the end of this week at best. So we are, we're going to have some more um, frustrations from our community. And I'm, I'm very prepared to take that. Uh, I have broad shoulders. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm more than willing to, to be the, the target here. That's okay. Um, the good work right now is getting people scheduled to get in for vaccines. So we've had a lot of, um, which has been phenomenal. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, requests or, or um, offers to volunteer, to grab that wait list and start calling people. Um, you know, we still live in a world of confidentiality, and, and although, you know, there's been some suspension of some HIPAA elements, um, we can't just bring people in off the street and give them a, a list of 5,000 people and their personal information. So, um, although we do appreciate that, you know, it takes us about two to three weeks to get somebody through the screening process to validate to uh, do the background check and all those things to where we could actually release that list to them. If we're still dealing with this list in two to three weeks, we have bigger problems. So we're not putting our energy into that right now. We're putting our energy into finding a partner that can help us call those people on the wait list to reduce that anxiety while our staff stays focused on the real goal, which is getting patients scheduled. Um, again, uh, 400 doses this week, um, Slim chance that we might have 100 more for a total of 500 doses this week. Um, and then we're going to wait for more vaccine supply. Um, one really important thing, and, and if, if everyone on this call can help us out with this, um, I learned over the weekend that there was, a, uh, there was a report or a rumor that we had lost a lot of calls and a lot of information. Uh, when this number first got published for, for scheduling. Not true. Um, we have a lot of voicemails and a lot of people that we haven't been able to get back to to confirm they're on the wait list, but our system did not, um, it, it did not malfunction. Uh, we didn't lose any voicemails. We didn't lose any data. Um, so that might be part of the anxiety that's out there. Um, so if, you know, if, if that can be repeated as much as possible, that would be very helpful. Um, so the good news is we have a, a really solid process in our clinics. We can give 300 doses a day if we have the supply to do so. Um, we've got a great partnership with the county health department. I think it makes a lot of sense. We stick with that 65 and over uh, patient population, but the county work on the like the essential worker type categories. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense. You know, that 60,000, uh, <laughs> when you say it like that, Sam, it really, <laughs> really uh, gives, a, gives me a picture in my head. Uh, but you're right. You know, it's about 60,000 doses that need to be given. Uh, and if we're on a, a path of, you know, 300 a day from our clinic, Let's just forget about inventory and supply chain. Um, you know, it's 1,500 a week. Um, it's going to take a while to get to 60,000 on that on that trajectory. A um, couple other really quick things. So I'll I'll update you guys um, as soon as I have information on who we've been able to select to make those kind of auto dialer robo calls to the wait list so that they know they're on it. And then uh, we expect, conservatively, I'm going to say Monday of next week, we'll have our online scheduling platform available. Um, could be sooner, but I think Monday is a, um, a safer bet. Um, so as, as long as we have supply, we'll be opening up the online scheduling platform for people. Um, you know, so lastly, um, I just... I just want to emphasize essentially what, what Sam was saying. Um, this is a very difficult situation for all of us. Um, you know, I, I, I understand it's scary and I understand the vaccine is the first glimmer of hope that any of us have had to a return to whatever normal might be. Um, but it's not a light switch. 
we don't just flip it and, and we're done. Uh, you know, I would think best, if you've read some of the articles out, best case scenario is we won't finish our vaccination process at the national level until, you know, probably early 2022, uh, definitely late 2021. So this is not, this is not a sprint. It's a very, very, very long marathon. Um, I'm just grateful for our partnerships to get us through this. So uh, that's all I have, and unless we have some questions. Any board members have any questions? I see, I see Marita moving her finger. I don't know how to <laughs> raise your hand. <laughs> um, I uh, want to thank Mr. Leach and Mr. Archer. They've been very responsive to the innumerable um, emails and feedback I've been giving them for the community. And I think the county's in good hands with the partnership that's been formed between the two of you. Thank you. <clears throat> My first two questions are for Mr. Archer. Um, the priority for how people get scheduled. Uh, you said there were 5,000 on the wait list. Will it be, as you said in your earlier part of your comments, you called in 10 days ago, you go before somebody did five days ago. And just sort of piggybacking on that, when you discuss the online platform to schedule, who would be allowed to do that? Only those people that are told that they can schedule? And then I have a question from Mr. Leach. Okay. Um, so um, for the priority, um, basically we're going to be calling. Um, we're going to sort our list by age. And we're going to be calling. And, and so it's important for the public to know, um, you know, answer the phone <laughs> if we call because if we call and nobody answers, we're going to the next person. Um, so, and, and I think we just have to be able to do that to be efficient. Um, so that's, that's basically, there's gonna be kind of two levels. One is age within the 65 and up category. And the other is gonna be who answers the phone when we call. Uh, we don't wanna leave a message and say, you know, give you a half hour, or, you know, five hours to call us back because that's a slot that we need to fill as quickly as we can. Um, so that's that's kind of the process that we have. In regards to the online scheduling, it'll be open to anybody and everybody. Um, we, it will not substitute, um, it will be a complement. So we'll maintain our call uh, phone scheduling process. You'll still be able to call that phone number because not everybody has access to the internet or, you know, um, the ability to schedule online. And so that's why it's taken so long to build because we want to make sure, you know, we've been very, very clear that we're not scheduling unless we have a dose, a vaccine to give you. So if we have 400 slots, 400 doses available, if someone calls in by phone and gets scheduled, the online system needs to be aware that we have one less dose and then vice versa. So what will happen is there'll be on our website, there'll be a, um, a, a platform. And if there's a slot open, you click on it, you put your information in, that's your slot. And then we know that's one less vaccine dose and one less appointment slot that we have. Mr. Archer, you said you're gonna prioritize in the 65 and older by age. So if somebody calls who's 76, you'll and they called a week ago, you'll prioritize them over somebody who's 66 who called two weeks ago. That's that's going to be our attempt. I, I mean, I'll be the first to tell you it's going to be messy. You know, we've got, it, 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 there's so many factors involved. A, do you answer your phone? Um, B, are you available on Thursday or Friday? We've had a lot of people that have turned down the appointment because they weren't available those days. So, okay. I mean, that, that's a significant piece of information that's important yeah. for the public because you're prioritizing by 75 and older or age versus 65 and 
Well, That's no. <laughs> no, we're looking at the body of, or the population of 65 and over. We'll sort our list by age and we'll start calling from the top and working down. Not 75 and older, 65 and older. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Which is, which Supervisor Callaway, if I may jump in, keep in mind that the, the state guidance has been very fluid on that, that particular matter. Yeah. So, you know, if it sounds like Mark Twain or Public Health made one decision three weeks ago that sounds different today, um, we're trying to stay as actively uh, in concert with what the state guidance and expectations are. So again, we don't necessarily change that in a 24-hour window, but as weeks go on, we, we do want to be in compliance with what the state expects from us uh, so that we don't compromise vaccine allocation and, and those kind of things. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mr. Leach, your turn. Um, the uh, CVS contract with assisted living, uh, we know they did Avalon. Have you um, or any of your colleagues been able to contact them on what will happen to the rest of our assisted living within Calaveras? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that question, Supervisor Callaway. Um, we have not had luck in getting responses from them. We have been uh, in contact with the care facilities in our county. And what we've been told is that Foothill is scheduled now by CVS to get vaccinated. I'm not sure if I brought that up last week, um, but they are scheduled in mid-February to get vaccinated. So that's, that's a couple weeks out now. Um, we are, uh, we being public health, sorry, we are committed and in, in have been in contact with the other facilities, which are smaller than Foothill. So the other facilities in our county, we want to make sure that if they have not had appointments uh, through that federal contract with CVS, by the time that uh, Foothill is getting vaccinated, we want to make sure that we're stepping up to go up, out to those facilities and make sure that they're not waiting any longer than they need to. That is a little bit heavier of a lift from the standpoint of, you know, it's, it's very efficient, for example, for Mark Twain, to have their clinic right there by the hospital, um, make sure that if they're, you know, in the extreme rare case where there is an anaphylactic reaction, um, that they have the resources there and ready. When we start going into, you know, like a skilled nursing home, long-term care facility, we need to make sure that, that we're prepared for everything that can and might happen. And so, you know, it's good that the federal contract was done um, we're balancing that with our frustration locally and the calls we've got and the frustrations we've got from our community who didn't understand that contracting process and wants to know why we didn't drop what we're doing to go to those places and, and work with them. And it's, it is something that we've discussed in partnership with Mark Twain as well. And uh, I would hope that at the February 9th, uh, Stacy, am I getting that date right? The February 9th board meeting? Yes that by then we will have a very concrete update, uh, if not sooner. Uh, but we are planning behind the scenes to make sure that those residents get taken care of in that mid-February window, if not sooner, hopefully. And uh, still waiting for clarity from uh, state CDPH, uh, California Department of Public Health, uh, as well as CVS, if, if we get any communications from them that clarify this further, I'd be happy to put out a press release on that issue. And I know it's something that's important to our community. Thank you both very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Callaway. Are there any other board questions? Um, give you a moment. I see some of you lean forward and a no for right now. So I'm going to go ahead and proceed. Okay. Oh, Miss, Mr. Toffinelli, yeah. good to see you. Yes. Hi. I, I do have a question. And it has, it's for Sam or Dr. Archer, either one. Um, it was, we talked about it earlier uh, that you have to, you get your first vaccination and then about four weeks later, you get the second one to become immune. 
if somebody doesn't get their second one, is there a time frame after four weeks that, it, that you have to start over? Like if you wait six weeks, seven weeks, because you did have a chance to go in or whatever, does it does the first one wear off and you have to start over? Does that happen at any time? And what time does it start if it does? So, um, Sam, I'll, I'll try to answer this one. If you, if you have a, more info, dive in. Um, I, I think the true answer is we don't know. They haven't studied the vaccine in that way. Um, Moderna is pretty specific in their documentation that it, the second dose should be administered at least 28 days later, four weeks later. Pfizer isn't as clear on, you know, at least or, or you know, three weeks or more. Um, so I, I, I honestly don't believe we have good data and, and me not being a clinician, I don't want to, uh, you know, guess too much here. But what I've been reading in the, the news and uh, in some of the journals and talking with our doctors, first dose gives you somewhere around 60% immunity. Um, I think I've heard as low as, you know, low 50%, as high as mid 70s. Um, second dose gets you up, depending on the vaccine, uh, Moderna or Pfizer, gets you up to about 95%. I do not believe that you would start over, so to speak, um, for quite a while. Because I, what I've been hearing is the antibodies, your resistance immunity lasts they would think at least about a year and a half to two years or more. But the challenge here is, you know, we've got a year under our belt and we just don't know. There's not enough data to really say, you know, definitively either way. So um, I think that's why it's important to follow the manufacturer guidelines. You know, Moderna four weeks out for dose two, why we're so adamant about keeping those second doses. And then for Pfizer, three weeks out for dose two. Yeah, it's a fair so question, it's, and it's safe to say that. I'm sorry, Sam. Go ahead. Sorry, Supervisor Tuffinelli. Um, yeah, I, I think Doug covered it very well. Um, I just want to remind people because it's you know it's easy for us to use that word immunity. Um, we need to remind people that even after the second dose, you know that's that's where you would achieve 95 percent immunity according to the studies. So it's not a it's not a perfect immunity. And it's important that there's still so much unknown because of how new this is. So I don't want to pretend to, uh, you know, be a medical expert in this regard. But the things that, that we do know is what we don't know. And what we don't know is, are we still spreading when we have the 95% immunity? So it's important uh, public service announcement here, as people do start to get doses and get second doses, that they're making sure to still follow the same safety precautions. You know, there's a lot of reasons for that. And, and I'm sorry, this isn't exactly what you asked, Supervisor Tuffinello, but it's important information to get out there. Um, you know, frankly, you know, I might pick something up through, uh, you know, we, we don't know how the body's responding to it. And, and so maybe I've gotten two shots, and I'm probably a good example, right? I get two shots, and then I go home, and I've got a, a wife, and a part-time kid who who haven't gotten shots, right? And all it takes is for me to be, you know, in their close proximity, uh, you know, the droplets spread and pretty soon, even though I didn't have any symptoms and I have the 95% immunity, it's possible that I'm passing it, right? So it's important that even as you're getting your vaccines, you, your shots, you don't view this as, okay, now I'm perfectly immune and I'm Superman and I can do whatever I want. That's absolutely uh, not a good message to have out there. The other thing is, look, we're in this together, and, and we've got to make sure that, you know, there, there's no way to track, you know, we're not going to all walk around with a, you know, I'm 95% immune T-shirt on. So over the next year as this is going on, we've got to make sure that, you know, we're a community that's coming together and understanding that we don't know who's been vaccinated and who hasn't. We don't know who's carrying COVID and who isn't. And so the same safety precautions that we've been pitching for the last you know, 10 months 
will still remain very, very critical as we, we move into this year. Okay, so sorry for the long public service announcement. Uh, your question is a fair one, but I think Doug answered it very, very well. And, and the last thing I will say is Doug and I have been working with, you know, his team and our team. We want to make sure that at the February 9th board meeting, sorry to make the announcement, Doug, but at February 9th meeting, we, we do have a couple of our uh, local doctors, one uh, Dr. Atwell from, from Mark Twain, as well as Dr. Beatty from, from our shop in public health. And we want to get them, get them in here to give a little bit more of a, you know, an update from the medical side because it's been a while since we've had that. Um, so we'll do the best we can with the, the kind of common knowledge stuff that, that we can answer, uh, but that stuff's important too, and, and we want to make sure that we're communicating that as well. Thank, thank you for that, and thank you for that announcement. So it's going to be just as critical as, as getting a, a core people that progress through the phone calls and making the appointments, and then a separate crew making sure that you're, you're getting appointments for the second dose and tracking those so nobody's overlooked and not told to come in for their second dose after four weeks, five weeks, whatever. So, so th there's a lot of tracking that needs to be done here. So there's a lot of work just involved just before you even get it, your dose or even your second dose that needs to be maintained and tracked. So uh, sure. thank you very much for all the work, both of you and your staffs. You're welcome. There is, and, and there are obviously uh, specific medical questions that come up over time. That's why we do have a medical officer. Uh, we do run those things by them as they come up. Um, so, you know, sometimes people get into, uh, you know, I, I ran a slight fever after I got the first dose. Do I get the second dose? Those kind of things we staff and have processes in place for, but this isn't the format to address those things broadly, or it starts to spread, you know, kind of misinformation. People try to apply, you know, it's like going on WebMD and trying to diagnose yourself. It's just, it's something we've really got to be careful about. Make sure we do it individually where it should happen in conjunction with people's individual medical providers. And, you know, per our last announcement, when I addressed this last week, week before, uh, you know, to make sure that, you know, now's the time. Reach out to your medical providers. Make sure you get the information you need to get about getting vaccinated individually. Okay? Thank you. Uh, was that all, Mr. Toffinelli? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Garamendi, thank you for waiting patiently with your hand up. No worries. Um, you know, first off, thank you both for your presentation today. There's a lot of new information that we're all hearing here today. I have an absolute ton of detailed questions that I'm not going to open up at this, at this stage in the meeting. But what I want to know is you both expressed that you're uh, in many ways being overwhelmed by the response and by everything that's going on. And so I want to know what you need from your board of supervisors and to enable you to scale up to meet this challenge. Uh, so we don't just weather it in a uh, in a block position, but that we actually move forward. So tell us what you need from us to make you successful and this county healthier. Who wants, you want me to go, Tam? <laughs> I, Sorry, Doug. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, so so thank you, Supervisor Garamond. Yeah, I appreciate the. The offer, um, you know, quite, quite simply, it is vaccine supply. Um, I mean, that's the number one thing, obviously. Um, but if I mean, I traded a lot of messages back and forth with uh, Miss Callaway over the weekend. If you have, if you have constituents that you feel I should be connecting with and, and reaching out to, I'm happy to do that. Um, you know, I think I, I don't know that we can give them the news that they want. However, uh, if they want to, if, if you think I can help, if you think I can help explain the process or answer questions for individuals, I'm happy to do so. Um, I think communication is going to be the key. So as, as you always do, um, all of our board of supervisors and, and elected officials, just sharing what we talk about. Um, and if you have, 
have opportunities. Um, I'll volunteer myself. I won't volunteer Sam for this, although if you want to join me, you can. Um, if there's groups that are meeting uh, via Zoom or otherwise, um, you know, large bodies of people that you think it would be beneficial for, for me to address, I'm, I'm really happy to do that. Uh, you know, I, it's, it can, you know, take some time to do so, but I think it's good information and I, I'd rather communicate as much as possible with the, the people directly impacted. So I, I know you have my contact info. Um, if not, um, I know Sam does. Um, and I, I'm truly happy to, to field calls or emails or, or, or get up and speak to whatever groups you think would be helpful. Aside from that, we're, you know, we're really okay. We have the staff that we need. We've got the supplies that we need. Uh, if you could, you know, change the weather, um, that would be helpful because when we're doing the outdoor vaccine clinic, rain and cold isn't fun, but I don't know if that's within your scope as a supervisor to change the weather. Um, but if it is, that would help. Sam, same question. Yeah, it's amazing after, uh, you, you would think that Doug and I rehearsed this answer together, and I can assure you we did not. Um, you know, you say communication is key, and you kind of took the words out of my mouth, Doug, because I think a lot of the frustrations, frankly, on, uh, well, I won't put words in your mouth, Supervisor Dear Mindy, but a lot of the frustrations that I've seen from board members in general and from myself are both about just the intense timing that we're going through and how difficult it is to cross-communicate that information. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, every two weeks of a board update is just nowhere near enough right now. Uh, because look at the amount of information that has changed from, uh, you know, the day that I was appointed interim, December 22nd, to January 12th, by the time I got up here, and how much kind of misinformation starts floating around out there. And then we try to clear it up. And then from the 12th to the 19th, and then again from the 19th to the 26th, you know, by the time I get up in front of, of the board members, um, you all are sometimes hearing things for the first time. And if you know government well, you know that I should never do that, right? I mean, you guys should know in advance of what I'm going to say. And the reality is these things are moving so fast. Uh, my deputy director and I are on state calls at night, in the morning, we're missing one right now, uh, talking about vaccine distribution and allocation at the state level. And I guarantee there'll be another one tonight. And it's just constant flow of information. And the change of that information happens quicker than we can get it to you. So you ask what I needed. Um, I'm getting a lot of the things that I need already. We have a partnership with OES. OES helped us build the data dashboard in conjunction with IT and admin. Uh, the data dashboard has been helpful in reducing some of the workload with press releases because that information is available now, today, daily, Monday through Friday. It's, it's updated. We got the call center going. That's been an incredible help to both Mark Twain, frankly, in taking messages um, as well as uh, our public health staff, which was fielding hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of calls a day. Um, so those things have been helpful. But really, it's getting back to communication. And frankly, uh, I think you guys have challenged me to communicate to you as much as I possibly can. You wanted transparency. You wanted clarity. Uh, I, I believe that I've raised the bar on that to an extent. Um, and it's not enough. And it's nowhere near enough. So I w my challenge back would be, that as much time as you guys want to give, as much as we need to have public briefings, if you want that to be in another format, we're happy to to explore that and do what we can. Now we want to make sure that that's in a way that doesn't, you know, constantly pull us off getting the the information from the other side, right, from the state and all of that. But I think it's important to be communicating as much as we can with the public, and you guys are the first layer to that a lot of times because you're hearing from constituents who are frustrated because they don't know what the answers are. And I'm trying to cross-communicate a lot of information. And the flow, frankly, is, you know, if we were doing this once a week, would it be enough? Probably not. But it's, you know, how many times can we meet and get together and disseminate the information? But I know that every couple of weeks is a lifetime right now. 
Doug, is that fair? I mean, I'm sorry to punt here, but two weeks, it's, it's I went back to my notes, Supervisor Garamendi, this morning for what even happened on January 12th. And as I was reading those notes, I thought, I, I hardly even remember this. I mean, two weeks is a working quarter right now for me. Yeah, Sam, I, I get it. We've been doing this since March, so I, I understand how things change. Thank you. But, um, you know, I think, and what I'm hearing from you and Doug is that you need help in communicating. And I think you hit the right tone, which is we can't help you communicate if we don't know what's going on. And that's in a granular matter. And these are things we'll get into later, but, you know, understanding how Mark Twain is prioritizing that 65 plus is really important. Understanding and feeling, you gave me a doubtful look there, Sam, um, but uh, understanding that we're coordinating our lists uh, with Mark Twain so we know who got done. Those are the things that we need to understand so we can communicate. Um, the, seems like when you talk about what our restrictions are, and so I guess you've got what you need, but when our, I have two questions regarding vaccine. One, what is the methodology that the state uses or Mark, or excuse me, Dignity uses, both of you, both use, to distribute the vaccine? What are the limiting factors to our getting that vaccine? Is it storage? Is it pow Is it signups? What is it? And, and then sort of help me understand how we uh, are allocating that. And more important, let's assume that the, the new president is able to get 100 million doses out there. Are we, do we have what we need to rapidly scale to get that? So we could fill that football sized plane, football field sized plane that Sam described earlier in a quick and efficient manner using all the resources we have in this county to help keep our people alive. So if you could answer those two very broad questions, I'd appreciate it. First one being limiting factor. First one being what? First one being what is the path for us getting more vaccines? What is limiting that? Um, is it a state? Yeah. Where, where, where's, the, where's the narrowing of the band uh, for this throughput? Gotcha. Uh, and I'm sorry, I was, I was squinting because the communication was coming through a little foggy. Okay. Yeah, but trying to trying to interpret my uh, nonverbals is fool's gold. So I apologize for that. Well, on my screen, I've got you sitting right next to Doug. So <laughs> dual panel. Nice. My head look must look massive in there, especially with all this glare. Uh, look, the the flow from the state is a. Incredibly frustrating thing to explain. Where we started, so here's here's a short answer. The answer to that in December was different than the answer is in January, and it will be different in February. So right now, what we're getting is the MCEs, such as Dignity, right, which gets the supply and then filters into Mark Twain, get applies for their own allocation. But then we also share allocation with them at times if we get enough to where we know they have this efficiency clinic going with the population we need to target, we can throw them 300 doses and they can get it done in a day like that, right? They've got it going. So we get our allocation, they get their allocation separately. There's the CVS, Walgreens, federal allocations. Uh, and then there's the other private entities. So it's been pretty messy. The state's frustration with that is trying to get data transparency. And the state's most recent answer for that, that, that they're looking at right now, uh, that I expect to be a change, is that they're trying to build in a third party administrator. Now the third party administrator, uh, and Doug, I'm not sure if you're up on this yet, uh, but the third party administrator would completely be a game changer in how we receive allocation. And unfortunately, I'm a little skeptical that that's going to immediately improve things. Because I hear third party administrator and I think another level of bureaucracy. Right now, we get doses, we put them into arms. Okay? We have our tiers, uh, we know that we need to be working with the 65 plus, and parallel, we're boarding that plane with the other folks in that tier that I mentioned. And we try to do it in a structured way, and it depends on the flow. So there's a science to it because there's the tiers that are built in and who's our most risky. 
but then there's also the art of, okay, we scheduled 100 IHSS workers and 80 of them uh, showed and 20 of them canceled or no-showed and we're ready to go with these other 20 doses. What do we do with them? So that's what I mean. There's also an art to it of, great, we've got this other small pod of people that we were planning to do next week. Call them in right now if they can come, right? So that we're not wasting doses. I guess so, my question is, Sam, are we limited on our side for this throughput? Is it is it quite? Do they look at us and say we don't have capacity for storage? Uh, we no. don't have capacity to put them in arms. Is there anything on our side that we can remove to make this better um, without trying to figure out what's going on in the state's head? No, no, we've we've gotten nowhere near capacity, Supervisor Garamendi. And, so and we have, even though so we're setting aside and so we're them. setting aside. The, the second dose, it's not taking up storage capacity from the first dose, right? It's not inhibiting yeah. us getting more. That's that's your question, right? That's my question. So that's yeah. not a hit. So then, okay, th th I won't get into the state. It's not. Uh, I will say, well, on the Pfizer, let me, let me interrupt, because on the Pfizer, uh, we did need the specific refrigerator um, so to get to a higher level, and we've got one coming in. Uh, we had to use a system of dry ice. For a while here but even so we haven't turned down it, you know it's not like the state has said hey we have these doses for you and we've turned them down we haven't been anywhere near that we haven't even gone to overflow freezer situations good we're nowhere near so do we so do we have do you have the resources that you need from this board in order to ramp up rapidly should things change i mean really rapidly yes. get actually have people on that football field getting poked yeah, I mean, I, I'd have a hard time giving you an exact number of what would be more than we could handle, but I'm guessing it would probably be, uh, oh, I can see my vaccine coordinator cringing by me making up a number right now. Uh, Don't make anything 10, up. I, I'm going to say if they sent us seven to 10,000, it would start to get a little difficult. Okay. Seven to 10,000. If they sent us that today without an announcement, uh, we'd find a way to store it. Doug, you with me? Yeah, we'd find we a way to store it, it, and we can and we could get about, uh, oh, I know my deputy's cringing now. We could get several thousand into arms per week. Yeah. Several thousand. It's hard to put an exact number on it because we have more medical providers and partnerships coming on board. Um, so as those people have gotten vaccinated and are now coming on board, like I said they would, uh, we're ready to go. You know, I, I threw down the gauntlet to the state, and I know there's a lot of questions and people have trust concerns with me. Uh, no, send them. Send the vaccine. Okay. Then you don't, so you're good. All right, on top you. of it, well, on top of it, I want to say this, because, you know, we also have, uh, you know, it's one thing to be efficient and to get it all out there, but we, we needed to start with, you know, when we did get this first batch and we got the partnership with Mark Twain, and the governor said, Everybody 65 and over, and it kind of opened the floodgates to some extent. Um, we needed to get that supply into arms, and we did. You know, we were challenged to get the, and, and that's, you know, Mark Twain doing a fantastic job stepping up and us partnering with them. But, you know, as we move forward, there are other things that we also have to be considerate of, such as um, are we reaching 75 and over who are difficult to get to? And, and those are the things that we're, we're building right now to make sure that we're as equitable as we are efficient. You know, so there's there's the initial part of we got this, we have the first people we have to vaccinate, we've got to make sure that we're getting shots into arms so that we're not part of the, the narrative that we were hearing in the media a little bit about why are people not administering doses, why are they sitting on doses. That's not, we didn't want that to be the case here. So we're efficiently targeting people in the proper tiers, but then we also need to filter out and make sure that we're getting closer to where people are and getting travel clinics going. And that is all part of a broader plan. And we will be uh, getting into those uh, areas within the coming uh, month. You know, a month from today, we will have already started that process. So those are the things that we're building now and that we're working with uh, OES and our partners and you guys uh, moving forward. All right. Thank you, Sam. And I have a, a lot of detailed follow-up questions, but in the interest of time, I'll delay those to later. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Garamendi. Um, 
Seeing no hands raised, I'm going to proceed. I would like to elaborate on a couple of things that Mr. Garamendi brought up. Um, you know, what when he brought up what can we do, what can we do to provide uh, help to you? This is we have m multiple more r resources that I think we can utilize through through the county right now. Um, one of those is OES. Uh, Mr. Alcher, you did bring up the fact that, you know, uh, the high volume, you don't have the staff to necessarily field all these calls that are coming in the high volume that they have right now. And you're saying you can't pick people up off the street because they don't, you know, because of HIPAA rules and that they, they need to go through background checks and everything. We have those people on hand through OES. We, you know, um, this isn't just a partner between Mark Twain Dignity Health and Health and Human Services. We're all here to be in part of this partnership. And we, we, we have other avenues and resources to provide you more tools to help you get your job done. And I, th I think that's our best way moving forward. And I would like to see, I, I, I would like to see you all reach out and utilize the, these resources because we have them on hand. And, and, you know, the OES stood up the call center earlier this year. Um, they've been through part of this process. You know, Mark Twain Dignity Health, yes, you're, you're your own entity, but we value you. And you are a contractor of, the, of Calaveras County. And, and we value is that. And we need to work together, consolidated, consolidate all our resources to help you guys. Because, look, there's a lot going on. You, Sam could be on a call right now, right, with, with the state, going through whatever changes they made today. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I just want to bring that, that up ser to back, follow up uh, with Mr. Garamendi because um, I think there's more resources we can bring to bear to help you, help you all facilitate that getting done, um, for one. Uh, I'm going to move on to a couple notes I made, you know, because we're all getting these phone calls and I, I do value, I just want to reiterate that I do value the work that you've all already done and moving forward this far. We just want to help you be successful moving forward and, and facilitating things more quickly. Um, the news in San Joaquin County uh, last week. You know, they had a drive through vaccination, no tracking or verification of who was getting the vaccine. And if they fell within their tier, that's open per the state guidelines. San Diego, San Diego County drive through vaccination clinic scheduled vaccinations. People turned away multiple times because of shortages on vaccines and overbooking. Um, you know, these kind of fall in lines with what you brought up. It's, you know, the, these, these are, everyone's trying to refine their process. We aren't the only county. There's some counties that are in much worse, worse shape than, I don't want to say we're in bad shape right now because you'd be able to facilitate getting needles and arms. But when we talk about the scaling up, I, I, I want to bring the, this forward that whatever we need to provide on resources, you know, you, you both provide the people that put the needles in arms. But when we have a drive through clinic and you need traffic control, can the sheriff help out with traffic control? Can, can we bring in some firefighters to help do the paperwork as people are going in? That way, you, all the people that have their hands on the needles are doing their job on that, and then we can help, help you through giving you more resources to be able to, you know, streamline that process. So you can bring it up to, you said, you said you you could probably do 300 capacity a day Miss right now, Mr. Archer. We're working with other people to bring that up. We can bring more resources to bear so that we can probably fast track that line going through as much as possible and vetting the people properly, which is another concern. Um, you know, questions and statements from con constituents um, you pretty much answer the, some of these, you know, calling center, they called the call center, no answer back in two weeks now. Um, you know, when you're overwhelmed with, you know, uh, 
this is what constituents are saying. I'm, you know, one way or the other, concerns may be a week and five days. But, uh, you know, as we as we move forward, um, you know, if we if we can if you don't bring in those people that you're talking about subcontracting, can we give you some people from OES? It's great that we would appreciate being able to answer people sooner. That would relieve a lot of the tension out in the community. Uh, that falls in line with my original thing of bringing in OES and wor working with you on the call, receiving the calls. Um, are we tracking everyone getting vaccines? Are we giving them to the people in the most critical need in their tier system, in the tier system first? I mean, this is a question throughout the state from any one supervisor's constituents, you know? We're all hearing this, um, calling CalVers public health and they refer, I don't know if this is true or not, but calling CalVers public health and they refer to Mark Twain Dignity Health on the vaccines. Calling Dignity Health and they refer to the CalVers public health on the vaccines. I, I think they're probably calling the wrong numbers. Um, so, you know, we got to continue blasting out those numbers. You know, there's a lot of public perception out there. You know, I want I want the public perception to start moving towards us being proactive more so and not reactive, although we are reactive when the state changes the guidelines daily. But this doesn't to break down break, to break down the brass tacks, needles and arms whatever the tier may change, if we can facilitate that process moving quickly when we actually get those vaccines in hand, um, then, you know, if it scales up, I mean, our new president's made a lot of promises, you know, trying to get up to 300 million. I mean, we, we state of California, um, it's been on the news plenty. Only half the vaccines on hand have been distributed. So, you know, if we're going to fast track this, storage is of a concern. I'm talking to multiple supervisors in other counties, you know, and other people working in other counties, just, you know, bouncing ideas off of each other. And, um, you know, cold storage is a factor on, along with population for, for receiving the vaccines. So, if we, if we need to fast track an item to buy more refrigerators for you or cold storage in one way or the other, we're, I'm, I know I'm more than willing to help. I'm sure the rest of our board would agree, you know, whether it costs twenty, thirty thousand $30,000 for a refrigerator, we could scale that up. Let's make sure we're putting them in places that are on backup generators. We don't want a fatal power outage and, and lose them. I mean, the, I'm sure the sheriff's office would be willing to help out with that if we don't have any other place with a, I'm sure the hospital's got plenty of uh, backup generators, but you know, at the same time, we do have other facilities and where they, they can be stored safely and then distributed out, you know, upon demand. Um, the, these, these are all things I, I've written down. I, these, these are all things that I want you to accept help from the county. We can all work together and all be one large partner. It's not just, you know, Health and Human Services and Mark Twain Dignity Health. We're all here for support. We all need to be successful in this together. There, uh, it was a little long-winded. I apologize for that, but I, I need to get it out and we need to say this publicly, you know, and I would hope the rest of the board would support uh, me on uh, giving you that type of direction. I, Mr. Archer. Thank you. Um, so I, I, I would like to report, uh, you know, the partnership has actually already grown. Uh, the call center has been taking voicemail or taking messages from Mark Twain, adding people to our wait list uh, since last week. So we're already stretching, you know, and accessing those resources. Um, it really fundamentally is a supply issue at this point. Uh, if, if I'm hopeful, if when the supply chain issues fixed, you know, I, th I think we, Mark Twain, have the resources to probably ramp up to about 2,000 a week. Um, with some of the other partners coming online with the county, um, 
you know, I, I think we can, uh, we can definitely ramp up, but we, we've got to have the supply. You know, we talk about needles in arms. Well, we need vaccine in the needle. Um, I think I think that's really the, the first step to it. Um, and then um, just one quick comment on like the the prioritization process. Um, I want to be very clear about this. We are doing our best to sort by age, but I'm going to tell you right now, there's no way it's going to happen. You know, consistently and and perfectly. Um, we will have situations where a 68-year-old is scheduled before a 78-year-old. Uh, and it could be because they didn't answer the phone or the phone was disconnected or they weren't available or whatever. Um, this is not a linear, <laughs> a linear type of thing. This is uh, spaghetti. <laughs> this is spaghetti. So we're working through it. Or the power was out and there's no or, phone service. Exactly. And, and I think... Mother Nature has more uh, curveballs in store for us this evening and the rest of this week. Um, oh, my apologies. I just muted myself. I was already on, unmuted. Uh, you know, oh, we're going to be looking to take public comment here in a moment. I would, you know, um, so the people in the public are aware. Um, are there any other comments for, from the rest of the board members or questions? Okay, would, oh, Miss Fondorf? Hi. Yeah, I, my hand hides up there. Um, I know you've been asking and you've been talking a lot about the vaccine, but you mentioned earlier about the purple tier. And so we have a group, um, you know, a community of businesses that what's next for them with the winter coming up and how are we going as a community support the numbers that we need to start focusing on getting on the lower tiers? And what what are we looking at? What are those statistic numbers? Um, you're saying we're above that, which I find surprising, but what does that mean? What is that in, interpret, interpreting into layman term for the public to understand and businesses and what we need to do next? Sure. Fair question. So what I'm doing is I'm multitasking. So if I have a weird blank stare into the screen, I apologize. I am looking at our uh, state data as well as the table. So for example, right now, um, okay, to get into, to go from the purple tier uh, to the red tier, right, the, the next tier, um, we need to have a case rate of between four and seven per hundred thousand. Between four and seven per hundred thousand. Right now we're in purple because our case rate is over seven, right? And by over seven, what I mean is, according to this, the state data, our county metrics is 63.5. So we're nowhere near, right? And then the positive, the other factor that goes into that is the positivity rate. So in other words, what percentage of people are testing positive or are testing centers? That has actually been trending down pretty well. Um, oh, and by the way, on the state data, because uh, I said 63 here, it's like 105, it looks like, 105 new COVID positive cases per 100,000. Um, that's really high when you talk about we need to get under seven. Um, the other part is the testing positivity rate. Uh, and the testing positivity rate would also, so both uh, metrics have to trend this way, right? So the other one, uh, we have to be uh, under 8% for the testing positivity rate. Ours has been coming down. Our rolling seven-day average right now is 13.6%. So just a couple days ago, I was saying, you know, we're more than twice what we need to be on the positivity rate. It looks like we might be just under two times as much right now. But those are the two things that we're looking at. So what we need, frankly, is we need less people to have COVID. And we need the tests to bear that out. And what we can do for that, uh, sorry to sound like a broken record, but we can, avoid social, we can avoid large gatherings, we can wear a mask, 
right? We can be respectful of the businesses by putting on a mask when we go in, keeping our distance from people, washing our hands, right? That's how we get our community fully reopened over time. But it's going to take time. And uh, Supervisor Fohlendorf, hopefully those numbers brought you some clarity. Was that too fast? Do I need to cover anything else again or provide any more clarity there? That gave me clarity. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, we'll move on to a public comment. Um, we'll give everyone a few minutes to call in, Miss County Clerk. Okay. Chair Stopper, I'm looking at this time. I don't have any hands raised, but I will see if anybody sends a message. Let's let's get let's give them a moment. While we're waiting, Mr. Archer and Mr. Leach, I just want to reiterate, we thank you for all the hard work you're going through. I mean, you, you, tireless days, I'm working them too, but it's a different different standard, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just you're truly valued and everything. I hope anything I didn't bring up earlier, I just want to prop up and support you in any, any way possible as, as we all work forward together through this. Very much appreciated. No, and I, I, I mean, it's nice to, nice to know that we have the support. Um, I think it's in, in some ways it's uh, really helped improve and grow our partnership with the county. Um, so, I mean, there are some silver linings here, but uh, I appreciate the support. Definitely. Thank you. Nothing yet, Ms. Clark? No, Chair Stopper, I'm not receiving any messages. Okay, um, with that, I'm going to ask if there's any final questions or comments by any board members. I don't see any hands up or people leaning in, so uh, thank you, Mr. Archer. Thank you, Mr. Leach.